much better. Sir, give me two minutes. उट India China relations current status Dr Chariji as uh, uh, we all known and we are shared with Barata he is a, a politician author strategist and a foreign policy analyst he is currently a secretary general on a forum for integrated national security that is fins and is a member of governing council of research and in information systems that is ris apart from that, from that he is also associated with uh, prestigious academic university uh, institutes in india like manipal institute mahe academy of higher education where he is associated with the department of india china study he is a defense chair with the pune university as well as he is also uh, associated with the goa university and uh, the topic watch what he has chosen today he has done is a specialization doctorate phd in the same subject so sir we are very much eager to uh, hear out from you about the current status of this india china relationship thank you sir over to you thank you thank you rajesh ji and uh, uh, a big namaste to all those people who have joined right now uh, uh, actually <clears throat> as far as uh, india china is concerned uh, it's quite a um, test for me uh, because uh, the subject is so vast and so wide for uh, three four reasons uh, number one uh, india and china have a very long relationship uh, these uh, two countries india and china are two very very ancient civilizations uh, uh, india civilization of course we goes back to so many years we don't know uh, mohenjodaro harappa indian in, in, in uh, indus valley civilization and even before that so many things have happened so uh, our civilization dates back to so many years uh, so many centuries so many eons or in 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 purely indian terms if you call yuga similarly the chinese also believe that it's a very old civilization uh, there are very few civilizations in the world which are as old as if not as old as india and china but they are much older Iranian civilization the persian civilization as we call it the present day iran is the is the remnant of what we call the persian uh, the persepolis empire the persian empire so that is also very very ancient and very old uh, the jewish uh, society israel believes that their civilization is also very old as old as uh the christianity and if christianity if christianity has to go we, we go back to christianity then that civilization also is very old ancient right from the beginning of the universe whether the religious belief apart uh, it goes to the days of adam so that is why there is an english phrase which says i don't i mean i know him from adams which means i know him for a long time so that is that is as far back as adams they go so these are all civilizations there are hardly about uh, mayan civilization for example in uh, what what is today's uh, uh, mexico uh, is called a mayan civilization which is very ancient then pagan civilization so these are all civilizations but what is important is the continuity of civilization except probably india no other country in the world can talk in terms of continuity of civilization and china also talks of ancient civilization but they use the word civilization only for economic and strategic purposes for example the bri belt and road initiative or what we, what was formerly called the obor one belt one road initiative was supposed to be the regeneration of the ancient uh, silk road silk road so they used to say that in ancient times china had silk road and uh, chinese uh, trade extended to all over the world so they converted that into a modern terminology called belt and road initiative uh, so if you if you look at all these uh, factors 
china can talk in terms of very ancient civilization so our our uh, relationship india china relationship goes back to those civilization period so if you go back i mean if you don't uh, if you don't go as far back as the ancient or what we call the um, uh, pre history civilization even in the modern times there is a medieval period in which there was a lot of interaction between india and china so uh, the most important interaction between india and china uh, was the chinese visitors chinese scholars who came to india and then they explored india and have written extensively as far as india's civilizational aspect is concerned that is one point another thing is uh, what we call buddhism so buddhism also we can say has contributed immensely as far as india china relationship is concerned so in indian buddhist monks first visited different areas what we call the uh, land route uh, uh, there are also references to buddhist traveling to china by the sea route and there are also references to the tamil kings especially the chola kingdom having extended military aid to china in the medieval period so uh, we know about uh, mamallapuram uh, in tamil nadu chennai near chennai where the meeting between uh, narendra modi and xi jinping happened and that is one place from where the chola kings had gone to china to assist china militarily against their fight against the mongols so you can imagine the kind of relationship that india and china has had and if you notice one thing this relationship has been from a position of strength as far as india is concerned militarily uh, and spiritually religiously culturally socially from all these aspects now there is a drastic change as far as this relationship is concerned from what was cultural relationship what was religious relationship what was spiritual relationship what was historic relationship what was relationship between friends has now turned into some sort of a relationship between adversaries so we have to study the present situation from the point of view of a the background b the factors that led to this kind of a relationship now so uh, the most important aspect of this relationship uh, we are uh, of course there are a lot of ways to look at the relationship and how it moved from international theory point of view how international theories have contributed to this kind of relationship at all we will not go into that kind of a relation uh, uh, theoretical aspect of the study now but what we have to see more importantly is three or four things one china's strategic rise uh, in the international system uh, and its implication for the uh, for india and the new developments that are taking place uh, second is how china's growing influence uh, sphere of influence uh, is impacting india and third is what is india's preparation and what is china's preparation before that we should also understand one thing there is always a, a study of india and china will also have to take into consideration the geopolitical situation the current geopolitical situation now the geopolitical situation in the last 200 years has changed drastically when we say geopolitics geopolitics the most important aspect of geopolitics is its dynamism it is not a static thing there cannot be a a a five year geopolitics standard st static uh, straight jacket geopolitics geopolitics is the study of geography and history and the combination and the relationship between geography and history how history uh, impacts geography and how geography impacts history it is extremely dynamic every day it changes other every half an hour it can change something as simple as that or as complicated as that now what what geopolitical situations have happened let us see uh, for 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 limit the area scope of uh, the lecture i am limiting geopolitics to first world war second world war cold war 
and the current situation. So after the First World War, what happened? All countries went into war. So many countries went into war and all that. India also participated in the First World War. And then those countries decided that we cannot keep on fighting like this. So we have to come together and form, I mean, not, uh, not fight. We should stop wars. War is not a solution to anything. So what they did, they put together what we call the League of Nations. Now, could the League of Nations uh, prevent a war? No. After the League of Nations, there was another war. That is the Second World War. So League of Nations failed. So League of Nations is what? League of Nations is a rule, a framework, what we call a framework for countries to uh, talk to each other and resolve the issues. So in, in another term for um, this kind of an institution is a, a what we call a framework, an order or what we call the world order. We must be uh, as, as, as students and as uh, practitioners of um, so many work that we all do, we must be hearing about this world order. So League of Nations was the first institutionalized world order system. World should function on the basis of certain rules and regulations. Now, who will frame these rules and regulations? One country cannot frame these rules and regulations. 10 countries will have to come together, 15, 20, 50, 100 countries will have to come together and frame rules and regulations and agree to abide by those rules and regulations. Rules and regulations are very easy to form. But if members don't agree, what is the use? So that is called world order. Now, world order is not an institution. World order is not an organization. World order is not a structured body. But it is the sum total of whatever is happening in the world according to a rule book. So, so League of Nations was the first institution that tried to bring some order in the world. But it didn't happen, it failed, Second World War happened. After Second World War, what happened? Then people decided that, look, wars are always bad. After the nuclear attack on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the war practically came to an end. And India also participated in the Second World War. And then United Nations came into existence on the debris of First World War and the damage that Second World War caused, United Nations came into existence. Now, United Nations from 1945 to 2022, we are in 2022, for such a long period, more or less the United Nations has withstood so many problems. After the Second World War, a major Third World War did not happen. But there was a very major war in between, say from 1940, 40s, uh, late 40s to up to um, early 90s. That was called a Cold War. Now, when United Nations came into existence, what happened? All countries were divided into two blocks rather three blocks. One was the pro-West, the Western block. Second was the Eastern block. So the Western block stood for capitalism, freedom, laissez-faire economy, individual rights, and democratic elections, and rule of law. Freedom of judiciary. The Eastern bloc, Although it is wrong to call it Eastern Bloc, the non-Western Bloc or the Communist Bloc, as people used to call it, was the other side of it. No democracy, state is supreme. Although Marx said that state will wither away, state did not wither away. State became very supreme. State became superimposed on society. Individual rights were surrendered to the state. State was more powerful than individual. And more or less, it was a one-party rule. There were communist parties in all countries, but all these communist parties were presided over by the International Comintron. And Russia, or rather uh, the proper word would be USSR, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, became the leader of that bloc. 
so there were two blocks what we call bipolarity in geopolitics so the bipolarity in geopolitics created a race for supremacy who is strong you or me america is strong or ussr is soviet russia is strong so the war between america and soviet union became a war for supremacy ultimately what happened soviet union disintegrated union of soviet socialist republic got totally dismantled and what was originally russia the russia of the tsar in 1916 17 again became russia of 1990s say 1992 so it was a monumental uh, happening so now what happened there were two powers bipolar one a one b b disintegrated so what should have happened actually what should have happened is a should have become the super power so it should the world should have become a unipolar world but that's what people thought up to 1994 95 there were a number of articles saying now the world is now become unipolar there is only one country and henceforth the whole world order will be decided by one country that is usa that was the power of usa in 94 95 but it did not stick for a long time as i told you there were three factors besides the west and the east there was another small group of which india was one of the founders was called the nam n a m non aligned movement this non aligned movement became a very big cluster of countries which was neither part of the west nor part of the east this non aligned movement had governments represented by democracy military dictatorship single party rule religious party military dictatorship everything was there so it was not one single idea that guided the non aligned movement but what guided the non aligned movement was we will take a call on support or not to support a particular country or a particular situation depending on the emergence of that situation and more importantly the most important element here is whether it suits our national interest or not so foreign policy is nothing but taking care of one's own national interest in the international arena so this happened to be the most important element in the world order but more or less all countries followed the world order so we come to 1990s when people were talking about in uh, america and russia another country gradually began to play an important role in world politics and that country is china so we have to look at the emergence of china from the point of view of the world order which was developing on its own so now what happened was china started slowly coming into the uh, global arena not that china was not part of the global arena before but china wanted to be part of the global arena on their own strength it is not that china suddenly decided one day and it became a great country no they were very very uh, they were calculating they were working on um, how to how to um, what do you call um, how to place themselves in the comity of world now china was not part of uh, the united nations now as i told i told before united nation is the uh, organization that decided the world order so if united nation is the organization that decides the world order every country which uh, has to be part of the world order has to be part of united nations but surprisingly india became part of the united nations even before india became independent that was the understanding because ultimately they said a country like india has to be part and then the british had already probably decided that some day or the other india has to become independent and the colonial colonialism was also slowly giving way to nation states therefore 
they thought it is all better to uh, make some of these countries which are part of the colonial uh, system to be become the member of uh, united nations even even though they are part of the british empire so india became uh, a member of united nations even before becoming independent before 1947 so we have to remember that Uh, one thing in in a very important aspect we have to remember that now uh, as i said the culmination of the cold war uh, actually coincided coincided with the disintegration of soviet union and emergence of a unipolar world but it was very short limited to a very short time and in that time two factors became significant in uh, determining the contours of Uh, say competition and cooperation in the last three decades from 90 to um, 2000 and then from 2000 to 2022 in this period what all happened you see one is uh, rapid uh, changes in the financial uh, banking cyber security demand and supply chain systems and uh, volume of um, trade Uh, uh, volume of bilateral trade multilateral trade and institutional trade all these things happened from 1985 90 onwards every country was talking in terms of uh, financial order they were working their banking systems people were worried about cyber security even in 95 2000 up to 2000 Uh, when the internet revolution took place people were worried about cyber security and then because of the multipolarity the demand and supply chain systems uh, began to determine the volume of trade whether it will be bilateral trade multilateral trade institutional in trade all these things happened in, in international monetary fund became very powerful world bank became very powerful and then one another important factor happened at the same time and that factor of in this bipolar world was uh, a new what in in, in uh, geopolitical terms what we called the new theaters of power contestation now what is theater of power contestation contestations we should see now russia and china uh, usa contested for power they both wanted to decide who is powerful you are powerful or i am powerful so all these areas wherever russia was strong wherever usa was strong the western world and the non western world as we call became areas of contest arena for contest between these two countries now in that order west was one colonial powers were another set of uh, countries where power was very important where this war took place between russia and uh, usa europe was one place where this war took place today when we see all these countries uh, like uh, belarus poland ukraine um, armenia greek and all this from turkey upwards northwest of turkey and iran if you see except the uh, Mid middle east or what we call the west asia all these countries the europe what what we call today the european union became part of the arena arena of the cold war then eurasia became the most important element as far as the cold war is concerned today then slowly what happened in the 1990s after the 1990 from 1990 to say 2000 one new area developed as the most important area of um, power contestation and that is called the uh, in terms of area it is called indo pacific region now what is indo pacific region what was earlier called the asia pacific asia and pacific now 
Asia Pacific is the area which is determined by the confluence of two oceans, Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. From 2015 onwards, the word Asia Pacific changed to Indo Pacific. So, all the references to Indo Pacific before 2014 2013, you will see they were all Asia Pacific. And then it started as India Pacific. Although the name changed, two very important things we should remember. When we say Asia Pacific, the importance is for Asia. When we say Indo Pacific, the importance is for Indo. So it is India centric Indo Pacific. Now, one country which has impacted the Indo Pacific tremendously is China. And China is neither part of the Pacific Ocean nor part of the Indian Ocean. According to international, international theories, Eurasia and Ocean, these two places become the most important element to determine the power structure of a country. How powerful you are, these two things important. You should be the powerful country in Eurasia, you should be the most powerful country in the Ocean. So now how to become the most powerful country in the ocean? During the Cold War, Britain decided that Russia should not, Soviet Union should not become the most powerful country. Soviet Union was already very powerful in Eurasia. But Soviet Union was not powerful either in the Pacific Ocean or in the Indian Ocean. Okay, So the British wanted to keep the Soviet Union away from Indian Ocean. So what they did? They created partition of India in such a manner that they created Pakistan on two sides of India, on the eastern side and on the western side. And they dismantled the Ottoman Empire. So Turkey became very, not well, once upon a time very powerful, it lost its power. And then they controlled Iran. The western world started controlling Iran. So, how can Russia get into Indian Ocean either through Myanmar or through what is today called Bangladesh, that time it was East Pakistan, or through India or through the British India which was divided into India and Pakistan or through Turkey or Iran. So the British controlled all these areas in such a manner that Russia will not be allowed to get into Indian Ocean at all. So Russia tried to get into Indian Ocean through Afghanistan of all the places. But remember, Afghanistan is a landlocked country. So why I am going into all this detail is to bring a reference of both Indo-Pacific and the importance of partition. How partition was not only on the basis of Hindu-Muslim issue, Partition was a strategy. Partition was mainly a strategy to safeguard Indian Ocean. Now remember, Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean have become what we call the IPR, Indo-Pacific region. So anyone who controls the Indo-Pacific region becomes the most powerful country. Soviet Union is unable to control the Indo-Pacific Union. Indo-Pacific region. This is where the rise of China and the Belt and Road Initiative becomes very important. Now slowly what happens, if you keep on following the historic process, China introduced what is called the Belt and Road Initiative and they extended all these Belt and Road Initiative to so many countries. It is what we call uh, the, uh, the flagship program uh, of about $40 billion program it was. $40 billion program called the Belt and Road Initiative. Now this Belt and Road Initiative became the most important element as far as China's extension in the maritime domain 
continental domain and the world economy is concerned so see what has happened is they slowly branched out from being a very small country now they have become a very big nation powerful nation only through belt and road initiative and all other such programs so if you see the most important thing uh the present uh, president of china xi jinping uh in september 2015 he announced that um, people's liberation army that is the pla that is china's army will reduce uh, some 3 lakh troops so that he can redistribute the extra resources to uh, navy and air capabilities and economy and in october 2015 china decided to sell eight submarines to pakistan and these uh, submarines some of these submarines were docked in sri lankan port of colombo also and downward to hambantota so their chinese navy was stationed in karachi they did not uh, kolom um, chabar did not allow them and then they wanted to uh, put it in uh, what we call hambantota and also they were very seriously trying to uh, plant some of those submarines in um, chitagong and sitwe but both chitagong and sitwe did not happen and then india raised hue and cry therefore even hambantota was a big problem for them but karachi still silently they helped all these things so it was very important for china to get a strong hold in uh, pakistan because pakistan offered a very good port that is called the gwadar so china wanted to take care of gwadar port therefore they wanted what we call a direct connection between beijing and gwadar so in order to establish this connection they devised a plan for china pakistan economic corridor so this china pakistan economic corridor is ultimately culminating ending in the port of gwadar so they put lots and lots of money billions of dollars to develop gwadar as an important port and through gwadar they can trade with all asian countries all other countries in the indian ocean and also west asia and more importantly africa so in order to get into all these places they went and put a big port in gwadar but how to reach gwadar to reach gwadar you will have to either come through afghanistan or through iran or through india india will not allow them to go to gwadar Iran will not allow them to go to Gwadar. Pakistan is is a country which cannot be depended upon as far as Pakistan and uh, Iran is concerned. So the when only way to reach Indian Ocean. Now remember why Indian Ocean? As I told before, the most important element in the con- power contestation is to hold what we call a, 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 an important position in Eurasia. and an important position in indian ocean so the most important element as far as indian ocean was concerned was china wanted a foothold in indian ocean and then they used china pakistan economic corridor to get into gwadar but now getting into gwadar is the last part of it how do you get into gwadar so then they started talking in terms of building a road that is what is called china pakistan economic corridor so they called it they did not just call it a road they called it economic corridor and when they called it an economic corridor the corridor has to begin from somewhere so from where did it begin it had to begin from an area which is in the north so the area in the north which is the area in the north that is tibet that is why 
as a plan to get a foothold in um, in the ocean instead of heartland theory they called it rimland theory so as part of the rimland theory operation china extended its rule over xinjiang and tibet by by uh, militarizing and taking over tibet and xinjiang what they did china and india remember did not have a border at all in 1947 In 1947, there was no border between India and China. In 1947, the border was between India and Tibet, not China. We should always remember this fact very well. So, when we talk in terms of uh, border dispute and border talks with China, we should always remember. Someday we should tell the Chinese that look, we can have border talks with you, but that should be not a bilateral border talk, but a trilateral border talk. We will also involve Tibet. because tibet is an important element as far as the border is concerned because india has border only with tibet india does not have a border with china in 1947 in 1959 1953 dalai lama had to leave tibet and in 1959 china took over tibet completely in 1962 they mounted an attack on india In 1964, the first Prime Minister of India, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, passed away, died. But before he died, in 1963, remember 1962 and 1964. In between 1963, India instituted an organization to protect the border. What was that organization called? It was called ITBP, Indo-Tibet Border Police. In 1963. it was called indo tibet border police it was not called india china border police even in 1963 india stood its ground very firmly and said that our border is not with china but with tibet so we should understand what this all these nuances these are all very important as far as uh, geopolitics is concerned now uh, then after they took over tibet and xinjiang that was during the time of mao mao was the person who sort of um, worked on these ideas uh, after mao the most important leader who ascended to throne or rather who became very powerful was president deng deng xiaoping now mao's situation was different but deng thought that we will have to change our uh, slightly change our policy towards international affairs so what he said he gave five principles one is he said um, he said uh, i mean we should watch the situation and remember he was talking in at the time of cold war so they did not support the cold war they did neither supported you know ussr nor supported us so the term that china used deng used at that time was uh, avoid leading or uh, forming faction in any international conflict stay neutral and the chinese word for that if translated it says don't stick your neck out so that is number 1 number 2 china will not lead an opinion any kind of opinion in international politics number 3 avoid any trouble controversy antagonism in uh, world politics and on smaller issues just give up and the fourth and the most important element was concentrate on economic and technology development and the fifth was focus on creating friendly relationship with all the countries irrespective of ideology mao was very important mao said ideology is very important that is why the relationship between china and russia split but deng said don't worry whatever be the ideology of any country be very friendly create more friends forget ideology literally that whole the terminology said said 
forget old party ideology that is the word that he used now if you look at china from there from this point of view from deng's point of view you will see that china slowly implemented all these things during the second world war during the cold war cold war after the cold war china did not participate in any war and the most important thing they did was improve upon their nuclear um industrial and technology part of it so that was the most important and striking feature as far as china's development is concerned so uh, we 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 will not uh, deal too much into the nuclear doctrine as far as china is concerned but it is important to remember one thing uh, that 1950s i know you, you soviet treaty and all i am not going into all those details and um, uh, the stalin era how stalin helped china build its nuclear power and then how the treaty ended all these things are very very uh, what you call uh, we'll be going into details so i won't go into those details but what is important is um, china's nuclear program they called it it is for self defense so uh, self defense from whom they had problems with mongolia they had problems with japan they had problems with soviet union they have problems with india so it is self defense means they considered these four areas as problem for them mongolia japan soviet union in india and then uh, they had to create what we call the credible nuclear deterrence that was very important for them to create a credible nuclear deterrence and then they said uh, one of the most important pillar of china's nuclear program will be the idea of using technology and the arsenal as a counter coercion tool in the event of global negotiation of non proliferation and disarmament it's very important to remember these factors and uh, the other reason was that it should be a doctrine of limited deterrence so all these things they did after the uh, post sino us or uh, sino soviet uh, nuclear uh, agreement was Uh, terminated so this all these policies ultimately put together what they in order to do all these things uh, they created what you call the nuclear force under the direct command of what we call the cmc central military commission they created what we call the central military commission and put the nuclear idea into this commission so this commission will supervise central military commission will supervise everything and central military commission was under uh, pla and then they started using some of the best kind of uh, technology that was uh, available to us available to them the missiles the personnel and related equipment everything to be transported to rail truck all these things they created they created uh, various tunnels in various locations so that all these tunnels can be used as uh, deterrent capability is, and for logistical support and then in uh, in addition to the tunnel system they created what road mobile solid fuel missile uh, what we call the df31 and df31a uh, um, these are all uh, very uh, what we call the fixed based silo based missiles they are extremely powerful and technologically a marvelous technology what we call i mean in 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 uh, in fact the united states had what we they call the conventional prompt global strike that is called cpgs so the why a country is called to be very powerful united states we say is a super power why they are called a super power is because a, a, in, in military terms A, a country can be called a powerful country or a superpower if it can station its army anywhere in the world within the shortest possible time as of today us is the only country which can do this china cannot do russia cannot do india cannot do uk cannot do 
no other country can do only the us can station its army in any part of the world at the shortest possible time another thing is what they call the conventional prompt global strike capability us has this capacity so what they did was uh, they wanted to china wanted to uh, counter this so if any country targets china's nuclear force or uh, their command and control system uh, with a conventional weapon what should china do what should be the response of china so they said our response will be immediate and as prompt as the us cpgs that is conventional prompt global strike mechanism so you can imagine for china india is not the enemy they are not competing with india they are competing with the us militarily nuclear capability economy trade and influence now ideology has no place in all these things what is important is to hell with ideology but control is important so in this kind of a situation this is what we are faced with so you can imagine when we are facing such a situation how do we react what should india do india has got certain advantages and certain disadvantages now we are a democracy so we it is easy for us to align with the western world we are one of the biggest markets so all the countries in the world including china is interested in in our market we have got great production facilities so we can india can be used as a production center for the whole world now because of corona pandemic and post pandemic world order which is changing many countries don't trust china and they want to get away from china now is there an opportunity where we can pitch in that is the third factor that we should think of and the fourth and the most important element that we should also do is what deng xiaoping suggested those five principles one don't stick your neck out to develop your own capabilities economic and technological capabilities which is very easy for us can we become technologically so advanced that india becomes the most technologically advanced country in the world how to do that we have to change our economic system we have to relook at our banking system we should relook our credit policy we should also look at our education system so that we are able to impart education so many things we have to do at the same time so this is the kind of relationship that we are facing as far as china is concerned if you want to comprise all this relationship into three words we will we can see there are three c's in this one cooperation two cooperation three conflict when it comes to cooperation we should be able to cooperate with china china and india will have to cooperate when it comes to nas- protecting national interest and also putting a wall against our interest for example in the case of cop 22 cop cop 20 in the case of um, global warming issues uh, so that industrial back seat both china and india objected china and india were on one single same page they agreed to cooperate with each other and set emission rules and regulations as far as india and china and production facilities are concerned we will not submit to such kind of pressures they both came together so wherever there is need for cooperation we will cooperate we are ready to cooperate with china as far as even afghanistan is concerned rebuilding of afghanistan we are prepared to cooperate but they are not allowing that's a different story we will not go into this as far as competition is concerned if china is putting up some industry somewhere we should be able to do it equally well so if china is getting into african market india should also get into african market we are already late but we should do that and as far as confrontation is concerned 
we have given them a great and very good answer in dokla we have prevented them from do, getting their objectives completed in dokla in galwan also we have given them a very bad face so we are capable now we have to increase this military capability and we have to also increase the capability of our deterrence so if these things we will have to do so there are certain things which have to do be external certain internal things if we do all these things we will be able to compete with china as far as economic competition is concerned we will be able to win if there is a conflict and if there is need for cooperation we can cooperate on the basis of autonomy we can maintain the strategic autonomy and at the same time we can compete with this kind of a situation so this is overall the situation which we are facing as far as india china relationship is concerned i think uh, i should stop here and i don't know the procedure if there is any uh, scope for question answer uh, yeah, yes sir yeah we will have a 10 minutes uh, for question answers so uh, before uh, before that i would like to uh, interfere and uh, in our uh, guest today we have a uh, very important persons you are mentioning about the deterrence and the missile systems we have with us uh, program director of agni 5 ballistic missiles dr ramaguru with us right uh, good evening and welcome ramaguru nice yeah good evening all, to all of you and uh, bibu misra ji uh, president of indalco he has uh, been uh, working globally so he understands the economics of the globe uh, particularly in the manufacturing sector so i yes. welcome you sir and uh, okay. dr param uh, param sir uh, uh, from antrix he has been uh, i mean uh, part of all the uh, technology systems of uh, isro and uh, he retired as a commercial man normally engineers don't go into commercial things and uh, antrix was at its peak when he was uh, executive director of antrix the commercial uh, thing of isro and one more uh, star of our uh, saturday talks kapil nayak though oh. very young guy he has been giving a most popular speech on kashmir and uh, even now our people is yeah. talking about it he is from kashmir study center he is a fan of you also so i welcome you all uh, we have uh, abhimanyu abhimanyu ji if you had told me this these people are there i would have probably not agree to speak at all <laughs> i know i'm no match for all these people baba sorry so you know the way you are telling it's like a you know grandfather telling this and there are a lot of not many young people and i i, I you know the way you, they are get, going to get benefited from this afternoon i think that will change the way they think for this country for the next 30 40 years i hope so sir absolutely sir so that is the objective itself sir uh, because uh, we come across uh, one of our another fine lecture was uh, 90 days stay of uh, a scientist at antarctica he was sharing his experiences we were all thrilled actually how he lived in uh, such a far away place for 90 days Right. and uh, in antarctica now for a question this i just want to recognize people who uh, harish ji is there yeah our board director and, uh, you know, <laughs> good evening good evening tata's veteran almost four decades he has spent with tata's and uh, he has handled the uh, billion dollar projects of uh, tata blue scope and other things he is in fact uh, he is our director in the board so welcome you all sir Thank. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Good. Good evening. I have a question straight yeah. away. Sir, uh, it's more of an observation and than a question. We should not align with the Quad. Is my observation. America is absolutely unfriendly when it comes to you know, uh, you know its its policies. It has been supporting Pakistan for decades and has uh, sabotaged many uh, good projects in India. Uh, to keep india down because we were aligning with russia it has started doing the same thing now it has given uh, f16 bombers to pakistan yesterday or day before uh, the pakistan the american envoy was in uh, jammu in, in sorry in kashmir pakistan occupied kashmir and he says this is azad kashmir so americans are 
untrustworthy. They are not the right allies to counter China. Uh, actually, you know, uh, one of the things that the Chinese tried to tell us, Indians, was the same thing. The Chinese kept on telling us that uh, don't trust America. But as far as India's uh, uh, position is concerned, uh, we, we have to do two things. One, India of 1947, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 is different from India of 2022. Now, this is the time when we can balance. We have been balancing. We are supporting Israel. We are dealing with Israel. We are buying arms and ammunition from Israel. We are doing trade with Israel. But at the same time, we have taken an independent stand as far as Palestine is concerned. We are able to deal with Saudi Arabia and Israel both at the same time. We are dealing with the US and Iran both at the same time to our advantage. We are doing our projects in Chabahar, remember. We are dealing with so many other countries in the world which are at loggerheads with each other. We are, we are not supporting the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but we are able to deal with Russia and also balance our relationship with the European Union at the same time. So we are, this is and how best we can conduct this kind of a balance as far as foreign policy is concerned is what is more important. We should do that. As far as Quad is concerned, Quad was American idea, no doubt about it. But we have been talking about cooperation with Australia. We have been talking about cooperation with Japan. And we have held independent maritime programs with both Australia and Japan. We have got an independent maritime program with Singapore. We have got an independent maritime program with Indonesia. So we are doing it for a long time, irrespective of the Quad. When the Americans came in and they said, we should have a common uh, program as far as the ocean oceans are concerned. So we agreed. So Quad has come into existence and we have had a lot of meetings as far as the Quad is concerned. But Quad is not a structured organization. Whether it should become a structured institutionalized organization or not, we are not commenting on it now. But we should be part of the Quad, but at the same time, as Deng said about China, don't stick your neck out. We should remember that we should not, we have categorically said that Quad is not a security architecture against China. So I think our, our involvement with Quad is very important. We should continue to be there with the Quad, but we should not work according to their ideology or objectives. That is what I would say. Thank you, sir. I think uh, Kapilji has some question. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Deshati Chariji. Uh, it was a great speech and I have learned a lot in the last one hour. So, first of all, thank you for that. Uh, my question is on the uh, on the history part of India and China relationship. Yeah. So, on uh, 16th of December in 1949, uh, when Mao himself, I think, wrote to Joseph Stalin or said to Joseph Stalin that we in China, we are not in a hurry to be recognized. And he said it on 16th of December. Also, Mr. Patel and C. Raj Gopalachari in their letters to Mr. Nehru, they were very explicitly saying that recognizing China too early, even before the Western powers recognize, is of no use. Is of there's no great benefit in this. Uh, can you then throw some light? Then why did uh, Mr. Nehru on 30 December 1949 decided to recognize People's Republic of China when China itself was? saying that we are not in a great hurry to be recognized. First, we should put our own country in order. When China was not expecting, what do you think were the reasons of in, in Nehru's mind to, to recognize, uh, to, to go for early recognition of China? What were the technical reasons for it? No, uh, I, pardon? What would be the reasons for which India decided to go for early recognition of China when Mao himself wrote to Joseph Stalin that we have no 
no we may to be yeah, it's a very important question but uh, uh, naik sir actually it, it requires a lot of uh, time to go into the details and i am not an expert on some of these issues but let let me tell you one thing you know uh, i am not going into the intentions uh, of uh, what nehru did whether it was see but we have to analyze the situation from a very objective point of view uh, without going into the individual nature of the individual's person and personality and all those things yes, now at, at that time probably i'm saying probably because i don't know i have not studied that history from that point of view but probably india was pursuing a policy of non alignment and we were also part of the commonwealth so we thought that china was a new country at that time so a new a new country called china will be more useful to us they will be on our side as far as non aligned movement is concerned and we had a socialist leaning our economy was based on socialism when we had to start we started off with uh, russia we emulated russian socialist model of economy so all these things put together we wanted what we call the quote and quote it's a very wrong word it the terminology is very wrong but what we quote and quote the third world we were the leaders of the third world we were the leaders in a decent language leaders of the non aligned movement remember egypt and india were so powerful that the americans were worried about nasser and nehru coming together in okay. non aligned movement we were that powerful even the commonwealth was worried so in such a situation it probably india at that time i am not saying nehru i am saying india yeah. thought that it is better to keep china on our side so we did two things both turned out to be absolutely wrong we recognized china that probably we could have waited for some time but all this we can say in hindsight and second is when the question of china's entry into united nations is concerned we were the first we were told that we could be one of the p5 united yeah. nations security council membership was offered to india first but we said we can become the member of united nations security council any time but china is a new country let them get into the picture so we allowed china we gave up our membership in favor of china is yeah. a very big mistake according to me unpardonable mistake that is because initially we did not have what we call a strategic thinking at all so that was another very big mistake but strategic thinking and all that that's a independent lecture so we will have to <laughs> go into those details but now what we should be worried about is that is why i mentioned in the last part of my speech what corrective measures we can take that is what we should think of thank you sir thank you thank you for your Yeah. Any more questions, sir? Sir, you talked about China's, uh, you know, growth in terms of two things. One is the economic growth, and the other one is the technology growth. Yes. So, how they supported each other? Because right now, what we see, end product, they have done very good in economy and also in technology. And is there anything for us to learn from that? Uh. Yes, sir. That's a very good question, sir. Actually, uh, you know, every country, if you see uh, in the history of say hundred hundred fifty years or so, uh, technology has been the most important element in the projection power projection of any country. The colonialism started with the industrial revolution. It was technology which gave that kind of power to United uh, UK, the Great Britain. what was an ordinary country britain became great britain only because of the technology and then they used to say that um, sun never set, sets in british empire that was the power so they could use technology britain is a small country geographically but they could use the technology and resources of almost half of the world and then slowly the technological the power of technology shifted from britain to us so after 1947 and 1950 us concentrated us had no role to play in the first world war it was only in the second world war that they played a role 
and their second world war the role that they played was mainly because of their fight against germany had germany aligned with the us for some strange reason i am only saying ifs and buts probably the war would have taken a different turn and germany remember was technologically the most advanced country and then the second world war finished their technology and the technological revolution that great britain and germany created was shifted to us that is how us became the most technologically advanced country therefore the most important country and the most strongest country also then they created an ecosystem of technologically powerful countries one country which they created technologically very powerful was japan so from 1950 to say 1980 if you see japan turned out to be the most economically strong uh, power and also technologically strong power but because they did not have autonomy as far as world affairs were concerned they were aligned with the security umbrella of the us they did not become a global power that is where the introduction of china comes and then china did what exactly us did so they created the central military commission us created what they called the darpa you must be aware of darpa so i won't go into the details of darpa but all the technological innovation that has happened in the world today the us has introduced is darpa so darpa is now working on what should be us technology from 50 years hence from today next 50 years what should be the technological innovations that we should be working on that is what darpa is working now and that is what chinese military central military commission in china is working that is why i say that technology is going to be the determining factor as far as the country's nuclear and economic strength is concerned so that is where we should concentrate more on technology and that is more important for us to develop from that point of view since we are also a, a, a older power and we have our own independence as far as foreign policy and international relationship is concerned i think if we are able to combine this with our soft power plus technology plus economic strength if these three things if we are able to combine we will be the masters of the world thank you sir thank you thank you very much um i think we have uh, come to the end of the session if any further more questions are there you can always write to us and we'll uh, have it answered through uh, chari sir through an email and all uh i'll sir i'll take a one moment to thank you formally for uh, joining you. this today's session actually uh, we know that this is just a tip of the subject <laughs> and uh, Uh, we can go on and on in discussing and hearing from the uh, expert of the subject like you is always a treat and we are fortunate to uh, hear to you in person also whenever we visit your office uh, a special thanks sir for you know accepting for today's uh, session in spite of your not in best of your health uh, you are in a lot of pain we know that and so uh, it makes a sincere um, thanks to you sir for accepting today's session and we'll look forward to have you again in future Thank many you. times <laughs> thank you thank you for allowing me to speak uh, so much because uh, when i when i stand for lecture or when i start speaking i forget that i have got some sciatica pain and all that <laughs> so, uh, thank you for that yes. thank you sir thank, thank you sir. thank you thank you thank you, thank you for joining we'll meet next saturday again thank you everyone yeah. we can close the session thank you sir thank you thank you sir